Today we're going to look at something that's very, very, very important. It's something that we should be looking at, looking forward to, but I think if we're not real careful, Christians have the wrong attitude about it, and it causes us to live our life in the wrong direction, so to speak. And what we're talking about is the rapture. I hear a lot of people talking about the rapture. I watch a lot of videos of people um, trying to predict the rapture, and I understand why there's so much focus on the rapture. I understand as a Christian why we look forward to the rapture. I understand because like many of you, I am ready to go home. I'm ready to meet Jesus face to face. This world is so corrupt and evil and I just get bogged down and tired and overwhelmed and I am ready to go home. But if we're not real careful, we miss the point of everything that we're doing. The whole point of a Christian life is not heaven. The whole point of living a life for God is not to be raptured out of here before the tribulation. So the point of it is, is that our focus is off if we're not real careful. And I'm going to show you in the Word of God what I mean. The Lord's really been dealing with me in some passages. And I think it's very important that we have a right understanding, a correct understanding, because we are truly have to be living in the last days. The world, as we look at it, is so full of evil it's so ripe for the Antichrist to show up and usher in the, the tribulation and usher in the second return of Christ. And it's important that we as Christians have a real good understanding of what that means for us. And it means way more than just being raptured out of here. Now, I'm ready today to be raptured out of here, but I do not know when the rapture will be. And to be honest with you, it kind of troubles me that so many people think they can figure out some mathematical formula or put in some program on a computer and count words and count letters and count Old Testament books and come up with the date of the rapture. When Jesus himself and the disciples asked him, said no one knows but the Father. But we do understand we can see seasons, we can see events, we can see times. And, and Jesus said that when the generation that sees all of these things, well, that generation will be the generation that sees the return of the Lord. And I believe with everything in me, that we are that generation. But the fact of the matter is, whether we're that generation or not, I have a responsibility to Christ and I have a responsibility to the church and I have a responsibility to a lost and dying world to be focused on the gospel. We lose sight of the gospel and the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the good news. And that's the main focus of the end times. That's what it should be. That should be our push. The fact that Jesus is soon to return should just make us extremely, extremely focused on preaching the good news, on sharing the gospel, on witnessing, on bringing others to Christ. And I'll show you that in the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 3 says, Beloved, I now write to you a second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by the way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and by the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers have fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the waters and in, and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water." But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away and a great, with a great noise, and the elements will melt with, fret, with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will all be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of, the, of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. So what we need to understand is, and, and we've probably all heard this. I've said it many times myself. I've heard my whole life. We're the generation. I've heard my whole life. The, the church is going to get raptured out. I've heard my whole life. Jesus is coming back and he's not. And the world just keeps turning. The world just keeps turning. And Peter tells us in the last days there's going to be scoffers. And there's even scoffers in the church. And Lord, forgive us if we feel that way. I know I have. And I have asked for repentance. Because it's a very confusing thing to talk about the rapture of God. And it's a very confusing thing to talk about the, when the times and the seasons. And we can get bogged down in that. But the truth of the matter is what Peter is telling us is that God is long-suffering. He's not slacking His promise. He will return. The day of the Lord will happen. But He's long-suffering in that He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the life. And that's John 3, 16. That, that's the whole reason Jesus came. That whosoever will believe in the Son would be saved. That, that, that's the whole purpose of the Jesus that we know and understand. The cross, the burial, and the resurrection is that God's purpose in this whole world is that none should perish. Well, the reason that none would perish is because the gospel goes forth. And that's the duty that we have, especially as we see the coming of Christ hastening to us. And we, we welcome that because that is the fulfillment of prophecy. That's what Peter says. You see it. The prophet spoke about it. But in seeing that, that should really spur us on to preach the gospel. That should weigh heavy on us for our friends and our families who may not know the Lord, for our church members, for our co-workers, that should really weigh heavy on us that they will be left behind. And I want to show you what the Word of God says about the day of the Lord. Now, for a Christian, a lot of times, we look at the day of the Lord and we say, oh, what a wonderful day that will be. The day that Jesus comes, we'll be raptured out and we'll be with Him in heaven. And that is an amazing thing. But we have to look at the other side of it. And the other side of it is a horrible, horrible time on this earth. As a matter of fact, in the, the book of Amos, the prophet Amos in chapter 5, the words of the Lord say in Amos 5, 18. Now listen to this. This is what the Lord says about the day of His return. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness at all? See, for those that are left behind, after the rapture comes, whenever that is, it's going to be the worst possible scenario this world has ever faced. It will be the darkest time in the history of all the world. There will be more deaths. There will be more chaos. There will be more sickness. There will be more starvation. It will be just such an evil, evil time when the Antichrist reigns and has free reign for a time on this earth. We, If we could just get a grasp of that, would not wish that on our worst enemies. So that should spur us on, not for us to sit back and say, thank God I'm saved and I'm going to be raptured out of this. Now, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, I think the Bible, you can go in and make a case for each. I really, truly hope and lean towards pre-trib, but I'm not so set dogmatically that I'm just expecting that I won't have to worry about any part of the tribulation because right now the world is facing tribulation like I've never seen before. And it's only going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. And the worst possible thing that could happen for this world is for the church to be raptured out. Now you might say, well, the best possible thing for those that have given their life to Christ is to be raptured out. And that is true. Even Paul, if you go to the book of First Philippians, or first, if you go to the book of Philippians, chapter one, when Paul is asked about his present sufferings and the fact that his life is sure to end pretty soon, this is what he says. In Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, he says, For I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and the hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness and always, so now as also in Christ, will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I live on in the flesh, this will mean the fruit of my labor, 
yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to part, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all of your progress and joy in the faith, that your rejoicing for me may be made more abundant in Jesus Christ and by my coming to see you again. So see, Paul says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And the better of the two, he's hard pressed. He says, what I really want is to go on and die and be with Jesus. But I understand that it's better for me to remain, even in my present sufferings, even in the tribulations I have to face, it's better for the church that I remain. And so really and truly, as much as we are ready and I am ready to go home, it's better for the church, it's better for the world that the church remain here. In God's loving long suffering, the church is still here to fulfill a purpose. And what is that purpose? To preach the good news. That, that whosoever will would come to the Father, give their life to Him through the Son, and they would be spared of the tribulation. They would be spared of, of hellfire and brimstone in the afterlife, but also in this life. We have a purpose here, church, and that's to preach the good news. It's not to sit back and say, I'm covered in the blood and I'm good to go, so I'm ready for the rapture to come. No, the rapture, when it takes place, the day of the Lord is pouring out of His wrath is going to be a horrible, horrible, horrible day. And the Bible says, woe to you who look forward to that. Woe to you who want that. Woe to you who desire that. Because in doing that, we don't have any compassion for the lost. So what we really should be praying, we should be asking God to tarry even longer. We should be asking God to wait. We should be asking God to continue to be long-suffering. We should be begging the Lord, pleading with God, do not return right now. Let me talk to my family. Let me talk to my friends. There is going to be a time when we will not have that opportunity anymore. The Bible talks about the same long-suffering with Mo, uh, Noah. The Bible said that God was long-suffering as He waited for Noah to build the ark. It took Noah a very long time to build the ark. And the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So the whole time Noah was preaching, as he's building this ark, people weren't paying attention. And Jesus himself said this, this, that the end of times, the time that Jesus would, re, would return, will be like the days of Noah. People will be eating and drinking and giving into marriage, not paying attention to the Word of God. So we need to focus, instead of saying, well, they're not going to pay attention, Noah never gave up. Because God was long-suffering. Noah preached, I believe it, with everything in me. The Bible doesn't say it, but I believe that pre Noah preached until the ark was shut. And at the time that the ark was shut, the door was closed, it was too late. So you and I need to be preaching until the rapture returns. As a matter of fact, my hope is that the rapture finds me preaching the Word of God. I hope that the rapture finds me proclaiming liberty to the captives. I hope the rapture finds me sharing the good news with someone around me the fact that the rapture is soon to happen the fact that the day of the lord is soon to show up the, the fact that the antichrist is soon to make his appearance should not make us sit back and relax and just wait to be raptured out of here but it should spur us it should convict us it should motivate us to preach the word of god and why is that because amos again through the word of god to the spirit of god amos listen to the prophet amos in amos chapter 8 Verse 11 and 12, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of God, but they shall not find it. The Bible talks about, Jesus says, in the last days there's going to be a great deception. There's going to be a great falling away. That's from the church. You can't fall away from Christ if you've never been to Christ. There's a great deception even now rampant in the church. There's a famine in the land. And if you and I have the true food of the gospel, if you and I have the spiritual discernment, and that's what we need to pray for every day, God, give me spiritual discernment that I will not be deceived. And then we need to take that true word, this true word of God, we need to find it for ourselves and then take it to those that are starving to death for it. The world is starving to death. For the true word of God. The church is starving to death for the true word of God. Not an easy peasy prosperity gospel. Not a God's going to bless you gospel. And the same thing is happening 
with the doctrine of the rapture of the second coming, the church is being deceived into believing that you don't have to prepare, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to worry, you're going to be raptured out of here. What about your friends and family that don't know the Lord? You should worry about them. Do you beg God for their salvation? Do you beg them for their salvation? And let me say this, church. You need to be studying the Word of God. You need to be looking at things going on in the world. And you should be able to give a true witness to the things going on in this world. You should be able to clearly to define the fact that Jesus is coming back. You should be able to clearly to define what that means for the people that will be left behind. And you should be able to clearly define what the gospel message is. That's what the world needs. Not just do it or don't. Well, they've heard it their whole life. So if they're stuck here, they're stuck here. Shame on us for having that attitude. The day of the Lord is going to be a horrible, horrible, horrible day. And I want you to think about the imagery that the prophet Amos says. It'll be like a man running from a lion only to run into a bear. Or he thinks he's safe. He gets into his house and leans up against the wall and a serpent bites him. There will be nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. It will be a horrible, horrible, horrible time such as the world has never seen before. And the Bible even says that if the Lord didn't shorten the days, there would be none left. Not even, not even anybody would remain. It's so horrible. We talk about the mark of the beast. I see a lot of people talking about that with these vaccines and these things. And we talk about, oh, I'm not taking the mark or I won't be here to take the mark. What about your friends and family that are going to have to make that decision? You don't know what you would do until you're starving to death, till your kids starving to death, till they're going to die without medicine. And all you have to do is take a sink, uh, just a mark, just a chip or a mark or whatever it is, and you can make your children well. You don't know what you'll do to your face with that situation. You better pray that God gives you the strength to stand. Now, today, pray that prayer that if these things come at us, when these things come at us, we'll be able to stand and not give in. We need to humble ourselves and not be arrogant. The fact of the matter is the church is starving to death for the Word of God. The world is starving to death for the world, Word of God. The, the colleges and the universities have just destroyed truth. They've destroyed logic. We live in what's called a postmodern world, which is that there is no absolute truth. Satan has attacked truth. Not just the Word of God, but truth in any form is being attacked. And we need to stand up and preach truth. We need to bring people back to logic and reasoning. We need to bring them back to the Word of God. We need to bring them back to absolute truth. There's a famine in the land. There's a famine for the Word of God. And the fact that we are about to be raptured out of here at any moment should spur us, should motivate us, should just overwhelm us with a burden for lost friends, loved ones, co-workers, church members, even lost people we don't know. It should motivate us. Our attitude about the rapture should be, yeah, I thank God I'm ready. And yes, I am ready to go. Like Paul said, it's better. That's what I prefer. But also like Paul, we need to say, but it's better for us. The longer the Lord waits, it's better for our friends, family members, coworkers, loved ones, because we have time. That time will run out. We need to be motivated. We need to be like, Noah, preachers of righteousness, the whole time we're waiting for the flood, knowing the flood's going to come, we're still preaching truth. And even though people mock us, even though they say it's never going to happen, oh, I've heard my whole life Jesus is coming back. I've seen it on the signs all over the place. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Even though they scoff at us, we need to preach the true word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is Paul's charge to a young Timothy. This is God's charge to the church today. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearance and His second kingdom, and His kingdom. See, we are going to be judged for our actions. Don't misunderstand, church. Christians are going to be held accountable for our actions. Not our sin, but we will be held accountable with what we do with the gospel. It is our responsibility to preach the good news. It is our responsibility to carry the light of the, war, the gospel into the world that's dark and dying. It's our responsibility. And we will be judged. The Lord will hold us accountable for what we do in these last days. The Lord will hold us accountable. And we won't be punished 
and cast away into the lake of fire. But make no mistakes about it. It will be a time of shame for us when we stand and we look at and understand that we don't have any crowns to throw. We don't have any trophies because we didn't work. We didn't fulfill the Great Commission. And also, I don't know how heaven works. I really don't. I don't know if there'll be heartbreak. I don't know. The Bible says that there will be no more tears. So probably not. But what I fear is that when I'm standing with God and I'm speaking with Him about my life, that I'll see all the missed opportunities. I'll see and know and feel the weight of those that were left behind. I feel the weight today. I feel the weight of people that have died and went on to eternity that I've spent a lot of time with and I never mentioned the gospel. That weighs heavy on me today. I don't want that to continue on. But this is the charge. Verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And if that's not true of the day, I don't know what verse of the Bible is that people have walked away from the truth of God's Word. They don't want to hear the truth of God's Word. They only want to hear, they have their itching ears, and they want somebody to scratch them and make them feel good. And that's what we have in the prosperity gospel. That's what we have in the Word of Faith gospel. That's what we have with all these people seeking miracles. And the same thing is true. We've destroyed the rapture. We've destroyed the second coming of Christ and that it's going to be this great and glorious day. And you don't have to worry about it. You're just going to be raptured out of here. You need to worry for your friends and your family. One thing I always ask people when I talk about prophecy and I talk about the book of Revelation, I ask them, I say, what is the book of Revelation? What is the Revelation? They say, oh, it's end times. Oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, it's the rapture. Oh, it's Jesus coming back. No, the Bible says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not about end times. It's not about uh, the second coming, but it's simply about Him. It's the fulfillment of His Word. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. It's the fulfillment of history. And that needs to be our focus, not the rapture, not the last days. We need to understand that. We need to study that. But our focus has to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That should be everything that flows out of our mind and out of our mouth should be glorifying Jesus Christ should be preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Not scaring people with the rapture, not scaring people with the mark of the beast. Those things are serious. But those things are secondary to the cross of Christ. Those things are secondary to the purpose of God through Christ. The rapture is secondary to me. The fulfillment of the Great Commission is primary. When I get raptured, if I get raptured, if I go through part of the tribulation, if I go through all the tribulation, should not be my primary focus. My primary focus should be winning lost souls to Jesus, proclaiming liberty to the captives, witnessing to people about what Christ has done in my life, showing them the truth of God's Word, showing them the love of God, loving the Lord God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving my neighbor as myself. That should be my focus until the very point that I, in a blink of an eye that I'm raptured out. That should be our focus, church. Not when. When is really irrelevant. Because I could die in an instant. I could die today. I could die tomorrow. Jesus could tarry another hundred years. And my life would end naturally. But when my life ends is irrelevant to me. I have no control over that. I have no control over the rapture. I have no control over when I will take my last breath. What I do have control over, the only thing I have control over is how I live my life here. Do I present my body a living sacrifice? Do I present my members and everything about me fully to God for use of His gospel? Or am I just going to sit back and say, oh no, I'm rapture ready. I'm ready to go. I don't have to worry about anything. You know, it's too bad. I'm sorry for the people that are going to be left behind, but that's the choice they made. Their choice can be manipulated or or can change by our choice. See, if we choose to show the love of God, we can change their choice. If we choose to preach the Word of God, it will change their choice. And what I mean by that is the fact that if all our friends and family never hear the gospel from us, we are helping them make a choice to be left behind. We are helping them to reject the gospel because we're not fulfilling the Great Commission. But if we're obedient, if we're willing to put up with scoffers and any ridicule and any rejection 
And I know that it's hard. But the day of the Lord is soon to show up. The wrath of God is soon to be poured out on this world. The judgment of God is soon to be poured out on this world. And I don't want anybody. I don't care who they are. I don't care how they've lived their life. I don't want anybody to go through that. And Jesus doesn't either. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. So today, as you focus on the world that we live in, truly, 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 our purpose is to preach the good news. And it is good news that Jesus died for us, that we don't have to endure those things, that we don't have to worry about our eternity. Our eternity can be secured, but only if we submit our life, surrender our life, repent of sin, turn away from it, and live a life pleasing to Him. Only if we truly accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And by doing so, we accept His Word. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And one command He left the church with is to go into all the world and preach the good news. Make disciples. We as people of God need to be preaching, teaching, baptizing, and making disciples. That needs to be our focus in these last days. Not when the rapture is going to take place. Not sitting back, relax, waiting for the rapture. I am ready to go home. And like Paul, if given the choice, my preference is to go on to heaven. But I have a heavy burden for the world. I have a heavy burden for the church. And I understand that God has sent me to preach the word. So until the rapture takes place or until my last breath, that has to be my focus. Not the end times, not the rapture, not the mark of the beast, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I keep my eyes centered on him and love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself, I will fulfill the Great Commission. God, help us. Forgive us, God that we focus on the wrong things. Forgive us, God, that we're deceived so easily. Forgive us, Lord, that we are so selfish that we simply think about ourselves being in heaven and forget about a lost and dying world. Today, I hope this message motivates you to rethink the rapture, to rethink the day of the Lord, and to focus in on preaching the good news. Share the gospel. Show somebody that you love them because God loves you. Show somebody the word of God that's changed your life. That's what it means to witness to people. You share your testimony. How has God changed your life? That speaks volumes to people. And people are looking for a light in this dark world. I encourage you. I implore you. I beg you. Allow God to use you to be that light in this dark world.